people always give testimonies about how, how they saw Nason in like a dream or about how they prayed really hard at a certain moment that was really difficult in their lives. And then things turned out for the better. And then they, they attribute that to, to them, like really focusing on Nason and really thinking about how beautiful and magical he is. Hey guys, it's X Morgan with My Spiritual Life, and oh my god, here we go. I have AJ from The Money Store. If you didn't hear about him in my previous video, he was he grew up in a cult called La Luz del Mundo, which is very popular in Mexico, um, but it's spreading, and this, this religion is absolutely insane. The stories you hear about their leader and how he's in prison right now, and the the members' thoughts and how they how they retain faith after such a crazy situation is actually insane. So I'm really excited to have AJ on. If you haven't already, click down below the link to his channel. And he, we also have some resources down there for you if you are considering leaving that religion or you're or you already left and you're looking for more resources. We're we're uh, putting the link for the XLLDM subreddit. So for people who are X members. Um, and then there's also a journalist that AJ recommended um, that we're going to link his website, a, a very credible journalist. And I'm also linking, of course, AJ's channel. Uh, his videos are awesome. I My jaw was dropping in so many of his videos because this religion is just absolutely insane. Okay, AJ, I'm so excited Hi. to have you on here. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you for having me. Yeah. So if you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself and then get into the background of, of La Luz del Mundo translated to the light of the world, I cannot wait. Let's do this. Yeah. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is AJ. Uh, I'm 26. I'm from Houston, Texas, and I am the fourth generation of my family, or at least, you know, one side of my family, my mother's side, uh, to have been part of this uh, organization. And uh, ideally, there's not going to be a fifth one. And that's what sort of what we're working towards right now is like dismantling this cult and um, just trying to get people out of out of this out of this ship that is sinking that we're trying to make sink. Uh, so what, what is La Luz del Mundo? La Luz del Mundo is a church that was founded in uh, 1926 by Eusebio Joaquin in around northern Mexico. I think it's like outside of Monterrey, something like that. So uh, very quickly, like Eusebio was uh, he was in the military and he left. And this is sort of in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution. And he he claims that on April 6th, that the night of April 6, 1926, he had a dream. He had a vision from God. He was he was sitting he was laying down in his bed with his wife in whatever abode that he's in. Um, and the roof opens up and the stars align and they say and the, a hand is sort of pointed down at him and it says, um, um, I'm not too sure what the exact message is, but it's like, uh, I am God. Your name isn't going to be El Sebio anymore. Your name's going to be Aaron. I'm going to make your name known throughout the world and, uh, blah, blah, blah. You're going to reestablish the original church of Christ. And I want you to go to Guadalajara to go and headquarter it there to go start it there. And so the, the assumption within La Luz del Mundo is that not, not the assumption, but the sort of one, of, yeah, one, one of the underlying pillars of, of the, of the thinking is that for is that uh, Aaron is the is the is the apostle is the first apostle of modern times and there hasn't been an apostle since the days of Jesus when he was crucified and then you know the sort of aftermath of that um, so they claim that humanity hasn't had the opportunity to be saved um, ever since back then because eventually like the church dwindled off and God was really mad at humanity for like crucifying his son and whatever. And so then, you know, uh, God in 1926 in the middle of Mexico gives this vision to this one Mexican dude. And then, um, uh, and then now, now in modern times, we have the humanity has the opportunity to have um, uh, an opportunity at, you know, at salvation. Uh, so, uh, I'm gonna, yes. I'll, I'm going to pause mm -hmm. real quick and just say that it's, it's so comforting to me to hear other religions say things like this and I just gotta tell you why because so I grew up Mormon right yeah and that yeah. it was the exact same story like like a God came to this person and said we haven't had a real apostle we haven't had a real prophet since Jesus and his buddies all died and like but now we have one and everyone else was just screwed but now we have one and yeah. it's so interesting to me because growing up in this framework, you're taught, you're literally the only one. You're the only 
church that teaches that or the only yeah. church that is correct in teaching it. And it's, mm -hmm. it blows my mind to see how many other religions say the exact same thing. And it's like, well, somebody's got to be wrong, right? <laughs> anyway, keep yeah. going. This is so fascinating. So it's, it's interesting because like this, you know, because Eusebio could have just, you know, the, these people sort of just pop in and out of, you know, um, just the sort of human history, people who claim to have some sort of uh, to, to be on some sort of divine mission and be like divinely um, uh, powered. And then uh, some, some, of these, some of these religions happen to sprawl out into, so some of these things happen to sprawl out into full on religions and then others like get to sprawl out in different directions. But, but even like the, the story of Jesus, you know, Jesus was, uh, Jesus began some sort of cult, some sort of religious minority within in the outskirts of the Roman empire. And then it, it eventually grows to what it is today. Um, and, and, you know, th these people pop in and out of human history, but, uh, so what happens is, uh, Eusebio has this vision in 1926. And so he goes to Guadalajara, he gets there by the end of the year and the, on a pilgrimage on foot. And then he establishes a church and I'm not too sure what exactly happens, but he gets some sort of like land grant outside of Guadalajara. Cause at this point, well, he gets a sort of land grant outside of Guadalajara at that point, And it becomes the neighborhood that is called the Hermosa Provincia, the beautiful province. Um, and then of course, as later on as Guadalajara grows, it starts to absorb, uh, the beautiful province, but, uh, but still like the beautiful province is where the church is headquartered. This is where La Luz del Mundo has its big white wedding cake looking church. And I believe this church is still considered the largest, the tallest in all of Latin America. I'm not too sure. Don't quote me on that, but it is like, it is really impressive. And this thing was, this thing was constructed in the eighties and maybe early nineties, but I think in the eighties for sure. And, um, um, both of my parents are from that neighborhood. They were born there in the seventies and they helped in the construction of that thing, of course, for free, because, you know, we, you, this is a, some sort of God's plan to, right. to build giant things like this, <laughs> but, uh, okay. So, uh, so that's sort of the history of the neighborhood, but, uh, but yeah, uh, Aron is in place, uh, from 26 to 64, he dies in 64 from something. And then his son, which is really important, Samuel Joaquin Flores, uh, comes into, comes into a position of leadership within the church. And then, and then over time, as he's preaching, he, he evolves into saying that he was the apostle the whole time. Uh, he was, he was, the, he was the, he was the apostle the whole time since his father, Pat, since his father's passing. Um, uh, and but so mm -hmm. a little bit of reference for everyone. So this isn't the current apostle we're talking about yeah. the church, which is that guy's son, right? So mm -hmm. this is, it was the second generation and he just said oh by the way i'm the apostle since my dad died okay got it <laughs> yeah so uh so so us for shorthand we just say that yeah you know when he came into the position of leadership in 64 he was like 27 he was like something like that and he wasn't saying exactly that he was the apostle but he was some sort of leader i'm not too sure how that works but eventually it grows into him you know claiming all these things and then me being born a bit later on and like having this idea that he could read my mind and uh, all these other sort of superpowers that come into the, what, what the apostle is. So uh, let, let me, let me get up to what the apostle is, but first let, let me like clear up the, the sort of lineage of, of, of power. Um, uh, Samuel comes into power in 64 and then they, they build, they build the big white church in the eighties. Uh, uh, very important that that was very important. Uh, and then, and then, um, and then towards, and, and then uh, actually under Samuel, the, the church really expands. It really, it really starts to grow international. It really starts to penetrate into the United States uh, into places like California, Texas, sort of the Southwest for the most part. Um, and then, um, and then, of and then Samuel passes away in 2014 from some sort of colon cancer or whatever it is. And when Nason comes into power, which is one of his sons. So Nason is the grandson of Eusebio, the founder. When Nason comes into power, uh, he's immediately, you know, saying that he's the apostle. People, people are claiming they had visions. People are claiming that they had dreams, or, or that they, or that they really feel within themselves that that God has anointed this man. And there's this whole like campaign for for Nason where he's saying, "My time has come. Um, uh, I'm the new sort of young face of this organization." And God told me on the day that my father died. You know, he he spoke to me. He said. He said, uh, this church is going to grow to an unimaginable extent, um, your, et cetera. You know, th th these, these are the sorts of origin stories that they tell themselves and the sort of like, um, th this is the drive behind this organization, which, you know, is just like some small, really weird religious minority in Catholic majority Mexico. 
Um, so, so what, what is the apostle? We can talk about the sort of the, the, uh, I want to explain that a little bit more. Uh, I've sort of, I've already explained how. And now yeah, someone is currently the apostle right now, yeah. which we're going to mm. get into is crazy because he's actually in prison right now and people still believe he's the apostle. But anyway, go ahead, keep going. This is. Uh, so the sort of uh, the, the doctrine around the apostle is I've already explained how uh, La Luz del Mundo, well, one of the base pillars of the, of the, of the belief of the doctrine is that you, we need humanity needs an apostle on earth. Humanity needs a middleman on earth. That's human in order to connect us together to, to organize us and get our act together. And then he'll, he has this, he's, he has the phone, he has the, the direct phone phone line to, to God and Jesus and the heavens. Uh, the apostle is the one who's going to, when we all die at the end times, he's going to turn us into Jesus. He's going to say, these are the good ones that, 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 um, that followed orders and whatever. And so the apostle is uh, considered some sort of like immaculate figure who is, who is, uh, who isn't capable of, of uh, of sinning, who whose authority should not be judged because he is God's representative on earth. He's the dude who wakes up at five a.m. every day and speaks to God, and like he's the dude who uh, who is uh, to some extent like omniscient to to, to, to some sort of like um, to some to some extent he is uh, he he's just he's just the most precious man on earth. El más hermoso. It's a lot of like weird language that that they that they throw at this man and. Um, sort of pamper him in and it, it, it gets really it gets really twisted because then the doctrine because in you know a person that sort of like spiritual power begins to uh, flip that onto their members and um, we'll, we'll get yeah I think we'll get to get into more of that in, in a bit but um, I'm not too sure do you have any questions I feel like I I'm just spitting a lot of no this uh, is so stuff. this yeah. is so amazing I'm just like give me all of your knowledge this is incredible uh -huh. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about the magic powers, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's almost like he has magic powers. And this is something that's interesting because growing up um, from myself and Mormonism, there was kind of this, like, there there are these leadership of the church. There's a current prophet of the Mormon church, you know, <clears throat> although they call him the prophet of the world, right? Um, yeah. but, but he's a prophet of the Mormon church and his apostles. And there's this, like, there is this kind of, they're kind of deified a little bit, but not quite to the extreme that it is an LLDM. When we say LLDM, that's just La Luz Del Mundo. Um, mm -hmm. And not quite to that extreme. And I'm just like so interested. Like you mentioned, so um, Nason's father died from cancer, right? If he had magic powers, like, did anyone like think that he should have been able to heal himself? You know, just tell me a little bit more about the the whole yeah. like he's well, it, omniscient magic powers and stuff. It, it's uh, it, it gets silly because um, it, there's there's just uh, there, there's there's just no there's just no room is left to like question or sort of you know pick a little bit at what you know what it is happening. What what is it that yeah. is happening with this church? What's happening with that family, the Joaquin family? And so you know the my response to what well, when when one finds out that, oh, maybe it was like a colon cancer, it was some sort of illness within him that eventually got him in, in, in 2014. But, you know, what could it have been? Why didn't he stop it? You know, he, he's the most precious man on earth. Why would he, why would his life end? And, and then God put us through this fucking like, um, sorry about the language. I'm not too sure if that's okay. But like, uh, why would God put us through this ordeal where we're like, oh my God, the man on earth is gone. The God's man on earth is gone uh how are the hell are we going to get to heaven has god abandoned us did we all sin so much that 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 god's like yeah screw it i'm going to kill this dude um uh, it gets really twisted because you know i remember asking those sorts of thinking those sorts of things to myself and i knew and i just knew that the answers that would be volleyed back at to me were would be um why are you questioning that you should be you should be busy right now praying for for salvation while he's still here while he's still alive like on his deathbed or something like that um you should be why, why are you tempting God like that? Why are you questioning his, his, his divine, like wisdom, you know, th these sorts of, right. uh, like you describe in your other videos, there's this sort of like, um, uh, programming they put into you where, where you're told to like, uh, why are you questioning all these beautiful things? Something's wrong with you actually for questioning. Right. You should be questioning the fact that you're questioning and actually the, the answer to everything, whether you're questioning or whether you're not questioning, the answer to all of it is just go pray more. Just go pray more and, de and de devout yourself more and like entrench yourself further into this 
into this really like just uh you know really dumb world of like of, of, of spiritual ideas that don't that that one aren't original which like we've already kind of talked about you know people just do these things sometimes and then two um it's not even like uh, very consistent and like unique it's just the if anything like uh, our humans susceptibility to these sorts of ideas says something about us rather than about how rather than about like what samuel says about himself you know absolutely um absolutely. so uh so the present situation right now i i, uh, I don't want that to escape from us is, is that uh nason came into power in as apostle in late 2014 a week after his father's death and everyone just kind of really bought it up and he starts to go on this sort of tour, tour, several tours around the world to different churches to, you know, go, you know, sell his image, show himself, say, hey, I'm here. I watch after you guys. I haven't forgotten about you guys, et cetera. And um, his uh, his crimes, his his crimes towards uh, young young women, young men, um, towards uh, towards just adults in general, his crimes in general uh, don't begin in 2014 uh, when he comes into power. But but that is but that is but that is when. The charges in place right now from the uh, Department of Justice in California, uh, that, that is where they began. They, they, the, the first charges that they have logged down that, that they're trying to, that they're going to eventually like prove in, in trial, it started in Rin like 2015, somewhere there while he's on like tours and stuff. So, so what happens is uh, he comes into power late 2014. In June, Monday, June 3rd, 2019, he is arrested in Los Angeles. He gets off of a private jet that lands like somewhere in the airport or something like that and then um the authorities are there they take him down he has like a suitcase with them <clears throat> and the church the rest of the church doesn't learn about the arrest until the following day tuesday june 4th 2019 and basically what happens well, well at least in my case but uh, i'm pretty sure for everyone's case like in general for the church what happens is like uh it's tuesday night tuesday afternoon 7 8 9 p.m whatever central time and we all get uh, everyone in their own church gets called to an emergency meeting at their church because there's a transmission. There's like a video message from the from the bishops, the Council of Bishops, which is which are the sort of like uh, the sort of like Congress, like below um, the apostle. They're, they're the sort of they're the most um, there's collaborators in spiritual stuff. You know, th these are men of, of real like intellect and they and they know the word of God really well. And, you know, they're in charge of regional of regions of where the church is located right. so so what happens is they give you a video message they say hey the apostle's been arrested it's not even that long of a message hey um hey the apostle's been arrested uh in los angeles we're going to pray a whole bunch um don't read the news um don't read the news we are your only source we are your only fountain of information uh this is a moment where the enemy's trying to tempt us to challenge us to challenge the church etc it's a very short message. And uh, for me personally, it was literally one of the most offensive things like I've ever been told because the, because, because like, <laughs> don't read the news. Like uh, I know, I know your, um, uh, your partner has, has been on the channel before. And, and one thing that he has sort of um, said is that, well, if I was in the truth, then like no investigation should end up harming it. You know, exactly. like if like, why, why sort of, why sort of concede to that sort of ignorance and uh, for, for the, for the purposes of making yourself feel better and thinking that you're right. No, it's a, the, it should be the exact opposite. The people who don't know the strongest arguments on the other side of the debate don't, don't know, don't know anything at all. They don't even know what they're debating at all. And so, you know, that's what happened to, that's what happened for me on the night of Tuesday, June 4th, 2019. I, uh, they gave us that message and I was out and then we all go outside of church and people like chit chatting and people are going to hang out and people are going to have food. And, you know, there's a sort of community there. I, I told my parents, I'm like, hey, can I take the car home? Can I take one of y'all's car home? And I take it home and I go home and I just immediately just start Googling everything. I, I just start. I'm like, I'm going to read the attorney general's the attorney general of California's um, 26 page like re re report on why they arrested the dude who is involved in these who, who else who will who are the co-defendants. Why the fuck was he arrested in the first place? My first thought was like, oh, you know, he's Mexican. This is some sort of immigration thing. He had some passport thing and um, something or, or, or something like that. Right. But, right, but no, right. it's, it's, it's something like much larger and uh, it gets really like twisted. Mm -hmm. So when they, when they told you he's been arrested, right. They didn't tell you why at all. Tell us why. They didn't tell us why. Oh my yeah. God. 
Yeah, yeah they didn't tell us why. And then, and then of course, you know, uh, La Luz del Mundo in Houston and then in other parts of the U.S., but then sort of generally, you know, the I'm pretty sure a lot of people's very first idea was, oh, this is a sort of like um, some sort of uh, immigration passport thing. Like, it's not going to be a major thing. Right, um, right. But, but, but uh, he's going to be- the most precious man on earth get arrested, right? Yeah. <laughs> Must be a mix yeah. up. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's horrific. And, uh, and um, so before, mm-hmm. before we get more into, I, I, this is, I mean, it's just mind blowing, but I want to, I want to backtrack just a little bit and talk a little bit mm-hmm. more about the religion itself so that we can understand just where the members are coming from. Cause this is just crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, I think for myself, like if I, you know, as growing up as a Mormon, if I had found out the prophet, like right now is in the Mormon church is Nelson. If he had been arrested for like such horrific things, like, um, I have no, like, I'd be like, well, it obviously has to be fake. Right. But it's so easy to say that it's so easy to say that when you're not entrenched in the, the religious, um, you know, conditioning. So tell us a little bit about the kind of the framework of the religion as far as um, salvation. You talked a little bit about salvation comes through the apostle, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm curious, like, I remember you even mentioning in one of your videos that I watched something, uh, your guest said something to the effect of like, if he were to die and I wasn't saved, there's kind of like this, this thing about you have to get saved before like something happens to the apostle i'm curious if you could yeah. further explain that and kind of the members view of salvation and what's required mm-hmm. um so uh i, I want to get into something first that so <laughs> La- La Luz del Mundo has this sort of idea that they are that they are on this track to conquer the rest of the world to preach the word of god and only and only once and that that they're just that they're just bound you know that they're, they're divinely like powered and divinely bound to to conquer the rest of the world spiritually, so to speak. And uh, since I remember back in the late 2000s, if not in the late 2000s, mid 2000s around there, that uh, I remember hearing the claim that there were 5 million members of La Luz and Mundo. Um, and that is absolutely not true. Some people have even heard that claim since like the late 90s. But but when I, but for, forget all that. Uh, I, I know very clearly I heard that figure back in the mid 2000s from like my parents or something like that. And they got it from somewhere. And but in 2019, when that someone is arrested, uh, you have PR happening. You have the spokespeople, you know, speaking to the media and saying like, yeah, we have still, we have 5 million members around the world. And, and so, and so that that's not true. That's just absolutely not true. Um, they, they absolutely do not have 5 million members. Um, and that, that's a sort of, but, but that's a sort of like selling point that they keep repeating to themselves, telling themselves that, yeah, we're pretty big. We're at this, at this size of a, of a group and we're just bound to keep growing. Um, and then one last point on that is that uh, uh, Inegi, I-N-E-G-I, which is the Mexican census, did the census like last year, and they released results in January, February of this year. Uh, they ca- they tallied it up in Mexico, and uh, less than 200,000 people in Mexico are, are La Luz del Mundo. And Mexico is ostensibly like the headquarters of this whole thing. And, uh, and forget even that, like a quarter of those 200,000 people is is people under 18 like this children so uh so i, I say that because um uh a, a lot of this th- this church is absolutely not that large but it is it is uh it is cons- consistently like telling it's telling a story to itself that yeah we're the perfect we're the perfect people on earth and uh we're we're bound to conquer the rest of the earth whether you're whether you're a straight at home wife and you're sort of giving your tithing to to this project or whether you're uh, a young man who joins the who joins the labor who joins the the the, the ministry. Um, you're also contributing to this big project on Earth, God's big project on Earth. The the most precious thing to Him that's happening on, on in all of the universe. Um, that's what they sort of tell themselves. And and then of course, how does one how does one like slip into this sort of thinking of themselves and thinking of their place within the universe, thinking of their family and what you know all that stuff. Um, there's a there's a very strict moral code within the organization. Um, people attend church very, very often to the point where it's like, you can't just go on Sundays. You have, you should be going like every day. Uh, but some people go every other day and there's three, uh, at least in Houston, which is a sort of sizable community, but in many of the, in many of the large communities of La Luz del Mundo, uh, they, uh, if not all of them, there are, there are three services throughout the day, one at 5am, which is like an hour ish, uh, one at 9am, 
which is um, which is like an hour-ish and a little more a little more focused on women. Um, and like the women sort of lead the uh, do do the preaching, do the whatever, do the sermon, their own like mini sermon. Uh, and then there's another one at like six seven in the afternoon. That's another like hour and a half or like hour. And then they pamper on other things. Yeah. Uh, over the years, they've added like another 15 minutes so that we can pray for the apostle, sing two extra songs at the end of the day. Like, um, yeah, so there's that. There, there's, a, there's a strict moral code. There's a consistent like uh, demands that you attend a lot. Uh, there's tithing, obviously. And I know in one of your videos, you had mentioned that at some point, uh, the, the location that you were at was posting how much each family was giving or something like that. That doesn't happen very consistently with us in La Luz del Mundo, but I've seen it happen. And, wow. um, and of course, like that's just very like toxic in and of itself. Um, people, people within La Luz del Mundo can't marry outside of the religion. If you do, you're going to get in trouble with God. You're going to put, if you have a child with a person who is not within the church, um, you're putting their salvation at risk. Um, you, the, the child's salvation at risk. Uh, people uh, so, within, um, yes going to clarify real quick and then ask some questions in the mormon church i i don't think i've ever seen it where they post how much people are paying but like mm -hmm. there's there's a name posted if someone's attending tithing settlement and that's okay. where it's like well it, that's where it's kind of like um doesn't seem really fair to be putting that public because maybe you can see exactly who isn't attending tithing settlement yeah. and kind of cause judgment there um i'm sure that maybe there perhaps that something like that could have happened but just wanted to clarify mm -hmm. that and and okay so you can't marry outside the religion right makes sense um i'm curious as far as like um with homosexuality is that something that's frowned upon with uh, yeah. Mundo? Oh yeah. So as for, as for the vices that are off, that are off bounds, yeah, no drinking, no smoking, no going to dances, no, no prom, no, um, no going to the movies because the, the movies, I, I don't know where this, I, this is something like literally the apostle just had a whim of it, you know, and he just said it. Yeah. I don't go to the movies because not because the sort of movies are bad people, you know, uh, church members watch the movies at home if they're like appropriate, you know, if there's whatever, no blood, you know, I'm sure there's some taboos, but, uh, don't go to the movies because it's a dark, it's a dark room and people, people do things in dark rooms like that. And you don't want to be near that. Um, but, but, uh, and, and so for us, you know, growing in the United States or elsewhere, you know, just us young people, there's this sort of all these like restrictions that we can't, right. that we can't tap into. Uh, another thing that's, uh, that I think is really important about sort of uh, setting the tone for, for the, for how our organization is its own little thing. Uh, the men and women sit separately. And the women have a very strict uh, dress code upon them. Ever and uh, the the church doesn't. The people in sermons don't like to don't like to admit that the women have it harder in terms of dress code wise and you know behavior wise also. But uh, uh, but it it is the women that have a harder time. Uh, the men for, for us the, the men the men's uh, rules are you can't have facial hair because um, I've heard it justified in different ways. It's like uh, you can't have facial hair because it's it looks unkempt or because you look a little too Muslim or you look a little too like you belong to another religion. Oh uh, but, uh, but either way, it's, it's a sort of attempt to, to shave down the sort of um, identity that you wanna have for yourself. Like just everyone doesn't have beards there. Everyone has a nice like clean cut, sort of respectable, presentable, professional um, haircut. You can't have any, the men can't have long hair. Uh, men can't have beards. You wear pants when you go into church uh short sleeves sometimes i hear something about short sleeves you really don't that doesn't really matter but that's kind of it for the men uh, for the women it gets much harder where the women have to wear long skirts starting around the age of 13 14 you know once they're getting into puberty you have to wear the long skirts uh because it you know it sort of sort of obscures this lower part of your body and that for, and therefore you're not tempting other men to look at you uh, the women have to wear chalinas on top of their heads when they're inside of the church or when they're ever praying uh, at home or whatever and chalinas are basically i'm not too sure what it exactly translates to but it's just a, a head veil like a little head veil that they wear on top yeah and the church justifies this through some sort of bible quote in corinthians where it says the women have to cover their head because the men are the the pride of god something like that <laughs> uh the women also um uh can't can't like show any uh cleavage no makeup for women although some women do it but uh, but again it sort of depends like what what pastor is what what pastor minister is near you and it's like monitoring you and whether other women near you are going to say something about you it, it gets really it gets really gross 
Um, Tell me, are you allowed to have friends outside of the religion? Uh, so, uh, so I think helplessly one, like if one grows up in the United States and goes to like a public school, like I did helplessly, you're going to kind of have friends that don't go to the church. Um, but within the church, once you're, once you're there, uh, they teach you that, no, those people aren't actually your friends. Uh, friends is a very, like, not sacred word, but a very, you know, the, the word is being diluted right now. You can't dilute it. You, the real, your real friends are the ones that are in church that hold the same very deep and foundational beliefs as you. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and if anything, those people that you consider your friends over there at school, aren't really your friends, but they are sort of acquaintances that you can eventually preach to and bring them into the church. (laughs) So don't Um, really be friends with them. But if you are going to be friends with them, make sure to convert them. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, Jehovah's uh, Witnesses do a similar thing. They, mm -hmm. they say, don't call those kids at school, your friends. They say, call them your associates because they're not your friends because they haven't found Jehovah. So Mm -hmm. it's just so interesting watching this like separation. It's very us versus them. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so hard to break out of these religions because it's like, you don't want to be, you know, ostracized by the community. So tell us about the shunning policies as far as the church goes. It might not be a policy, Mm -hmm. but maybe more culturally like- Yeah. If you are to be shunned, um, if you are to leave the religion or even maybe doubt the religion, how do people generally, you know, treat that? Yeah, um, here's some, yeah, to sort of add to you know, what you just said, just reminded me of something that I want to add to what I was just talking about previously. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm trying to sort of give like uh, a broad picture of how we differentiate ourselves, how the church is like di- uh, keeps itself with its, its own little bubble. Uh, another thing that's within our bubble is uh, the use of language. So like you said, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, using the word associate in place of uh, friends, broadly speaking, uh, uh, the language within the church is uh, whenever you see someone, whenever you meet uh, another church member, you don't say, you don't say, hola, como estas, or whatever. You say, la paz del Señor, um, which, which, is bas- which basically means the peace of the Lord, which means, which means, you know, the peace of the Lord has brought us together. He's given us this blessing of us getting to see each other. Uh, other ways that the language gets tweaked is you never say, uh, okay, take good care. I'll see you later. You say, Dios te bendiga. God bless you. Or whenever you, you never say thank you to another brother, you always say, Dios te pague. God, God pay you back. Uh, God, you know, may, may he record this, you know, this nice thing you're doing for me. Um, uh, there's the osculo santo. I'm not too sure how exactly that translates into English, but it's basically a greeting. When you meet, when you meet another brother in person, you shake their hand and then you take turns kissing each other's hand right uh the back of their palm which which is like really nice like but like i like i've enjoyed that you know it's it's a nice way of getting to meet someone and like uh it's a little step further than the handshake it's probably a little creepy for some people but i kind of liked it but either way the the point is more intimate and but yet it's a sign to show your devotion to the religion and and like it's all these signs that to like you that build community within the Mm -hmm. religion and also um can help uh you feel like more accepted and acclimated into that community so yeah yeah, it's like yeah i know the little behaviors um and if i mess up uh on a little behavior like which i which everyone does you know they accidentally say gracias um and then immediately the person will realize and like oh no you're you're a brother Uh, i should be saying that that's the that's a step above what I say to the rest of the world, you know? Oh my gosh. Right. We're special. We're we're better than that. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Um, So to the shunning. So uh, the shunning uh, is, this is one of the sort of features of a cult uh, sort of very black and white thinking that we're the very white pure people and everything else is black. Uh, The shunning, the shunning also has the, the sort of feature that no one can leave this religion with a good reason. People only leave because they want to go sin. People only leave because they, the devil tempted them to watch, or maybe they weren't taking care of themselves spiritually, and therefore the, the devil saw a target that they could acquire. Uh, the the devil's not going to come with vinegar; he's going to come with honey. You know, he's going to he's going to sound really sweet with his reasoning, with his uh, with, with all that junk. Uh, so yeah, they they right off the bat, uh, people talk bad about like people that leave, and people talk bad. People you know mentioned people anonymously within sermons saying like, I once knew a brother that did this and this, you know, they, they always harken back to, um, to 
don't to, to that path that you're not supposed to go down. And, and if you do go that down that path, you only went there because you were X or X and you weren't, then you didn't have like solid arguments or something like that, um, which you can't possibly have. And if you do, um, and if you do, that's probably the devil speaking. And if anything, no matter what, at the end of the day, one of the requirements is that you're going to have to pray more. You're going to have to devout yourself more. So don't, don't even, so just resort to that right off the bat, the moment that you start to have some sort of spark happen in your head. Um, so the shunning, what happens is, um, uh, it depends. It's, and it's kind of interesting, uh, for me when I left, uh, when, when I stopped going, which is what, you know, that's the first thing I told my, my folks was I'm going to stop going. They, they respected it, uh, to, to the, to the way they respected it and they still kept talking to me, but much less. And of course they were sending me a bunch of Bible verses and read this and read this and listen to this, please. Like, I want you, I want you to come back. Um, so I wasn't exactly shunned there, but I was uh, sort of put on alert. Uh, but when I did start saying that, hey, uh, not only have I, when I let my family found out that, hey, not only have I left, but I'm an online critic and I'm actually organizing a lot of people and I'm getting other people out. Um, that is when the actual shunning began, where it was like, no, we're cutting you off. Um, uh, you know, go get a new phone number. Just, uh, just go about your own, re just go about your own thing. But yeah, the, there is a culture of shunning where, um, uh, people that come out of the religion are, are, aren't, aren't taken seriously. And, uh, sometimes I'm very sure I'm, there, there has to be many cases where people have been kicked out of homes, where people have ended up divorcing each other because one person was, uh, just not to, not just buying it all, you know, um, uh, there's, uh, it, it's, it's really, it's really screwy and it's disgusting. And, uh, one of the, I think one of the key moments recently in, in the past two years that that sort of uh, exemplifies this current um, that that culture of shunning is and we're almost at the, at the two year anniversary of it on I believe it was on August 13th 2019 so this is like two months after Nason's arrest um, uh, and that week in, in that week of August they have the Santa Cena the Holy Supper which is the most important um, celebration that that the church has it's a gathering in Guadalajara I can explain that more in it later but yeah. but it, it's a it's a time when it's a time the Mundo members are tuning in to transmissions that are coming out of Guadalajara to live streams. And one of the, what, on the day before to the, so the most important day of that is August 14th. That's when the Holy Supper actually happens. But in the days prior, people are preparing themselves or tuning in a lot, praying a lot, not watching TV, you know, very like mentally isolating themselves and focusing on it. Um, on August 13th, 2019, Gilberto Garcia, who's a very high ranking like minister within the organization, um, gave a sermon about how uh, people who leave the church are Ebola. They are they're 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 um, they have spiritual leprosy. They uh, they're gangrene. These are infectious people who you know you shouldn't let near your family because if you let them near your family, um, uh, they're going to infect the 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 mind of your of your thirteen year old kid. They're gonna they're gonna get to your sister in law and they're gonna take her out and then it's gonna be even and this is just. Um, Although it's, although it's your, your son, your daughter, your husband, what have you, um, across the table speaking some sort of sense or speaking to you, like, don't believe them because it's really the devil working in the background and pulling the puppet strings of it all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you shouldn't even be entertaining those bad conversations, uh, those, um, those tempting, um, points that they might have, that they, that, that they're going to say that they have, that, that outsiders are going to say that they have. Um, yeah, the shunning is really, is real, real. Uh, I've gone through it for well over a year at this point, and I've sort of uh, eaten away at um, how much I have been shunned, but it's really not a lot of progress. And uh, well, what's very unique about us and the culture of shunning, so you guys have like a sort of culture of shunning as well. And what's unique about us is that we have, we have the shunning happening too, but a lot of the people being shunned right now, myself included, um, kind of have like the, the blessing of, well, we have this trial coming up ahead of us. We have this big public event that's happening ahead of us and that is going to be we're, we're trying right now to make that a sort of big breaking point for a lot of people so that so that when they get out it's you know it's just easier that they can get out in masses um as opposed to you know say the mormons which don't have a big controversy like come coming looming in like this one big like passage that they're all gonna have to go through um uh yeah th that's something that i've sort of it's taken a lot for me to think through and then think like, no, I actually should be grateful for that. Uh, it's not like I left because 
because uh, I, I read a little thing and then I'm the only one who's actually broken at this certain moment. It's more like uh, I, I woke up when a lot of other people woke up very silently. And then we sort of found each other online and built a larger community. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and yeah, w- that's, that's something cool about us. We, we actually have some sort of big thing coming towards us that could really help uh, and that we're all like working towards. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh my gosh. I, amazing. So, so tell me a little bit about as far as um, just some, some little details I'm looking for. I guess I'll just do one at a time. Tithing. What is the tithing like? What's the expectation for the members? Yeah, so the, the tithing is uh, there is a 10% uh, um, uh, 10 of your income that, that you're supposed to be giving. And like, and like you've described in other videos, it's uh, the sort of justification behind that is like, well, God gave you, God's, let, God's letting you keep 90% of it. Um, you should, why don't you give 10% back? You know, give into this big project that, that you know, we've got to maintain these big, crazy temples we got to, uh, we got to, we got to pay the ministers and feed the ministers that are out in like Equatorial Guinea and Africa, or that are out in the Philippines. We have to go, we have to pay them and support them to some extent. Um, you know, you got to pay for the flights of like the, of the pastors and whatever, you know, th- this is God's plan and God, God needs it. And, um, uh, so th- there is that policy of tithing. And like I was mentioning earlier, th- this isn't set practice where members have, the amounts that they gave or whether, you know, or whether they did give at all that there's no, there's no list of that, like all the time. Uh, but, but I have seen it before. I have seen it before um, at, in Houston, which is like a, one of the major, like probably like the second, third largest um, location in the United States. I know I have seen it for sure. Um, and then within the church, the, the sort of, it's also, there's, it's also the sort of ritual, the sort of practice of the little ceremony of, of, of giving uh, money which comes at the end of every service. Um, I don't think the 5 a.m. Right, one Passing the plate kind of thing, right? Kind of passing the plate, but it's really not, the, pa- the plate isn't being passed. It's more so people have to walk out of the, uh, walk out of the, the pews, the, the benches, and go and walk up to the front, right in front of the pastor, and go turn in their little envelope, go turn in their little dollar bill oh, wow. in, in, the, in the wooden box right up front. Everyone has mm-hmm. to go, and there's this whole little ritual of everyone has to go, takes their turn uh, all across the benches, and they all have to walk up all down the aisle to go do this thing. Um, and so, and so, you know, like everyone's eyeballs are looking and people and, and why is that? Why is, why is AJ just standing there on the bench? He's just letting people walk in front of him. You know, why is he not getting up? To, did he forget his wallet today? He probably forgot his wallet last week also. Oh um, my God. Uh, is AJ like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's that, you know, there's that sort of very public aspect of, um, uh, uh, of um of giving money um and it's just yeah it's it's really gross i'm curious what's their opinion on like further education like are they um do they push for college do they say to avoid college i'm just curious mm-hmm. so so that's yeah that's that's supremely interesting and i think that that comes into play for me personally because um I'm not too sure when or how exactly but i know that at some point within the early decades of the church Aaron, maybe Samuel. So, you know, pre-1964, pre maybe a little bit past 1964. But I know at some point within the organization, um, people have said that, uh, no, uh, people who recount the history of the church have told me that like, yeah, back then people weren't allowed to go to school to get a higher education because um, if you went, then, you know, that was the devil over there. And, and, uh, and Aaron way back then when he's really trying to entrench the church and make it grow and make it start, uh, he required it, one of the requirements that he needed was to get people to isolate, isolate themselves mentally from that. And, but then eventually um, I'd say in the later decades of the 20th century, and then especially like now in the 21st century, um, the, the attitude towards getting a, 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 a degree of in higher education has been, has become more accepted. Uh, but uh, it is not uncommon, absolutely not uncommon. And it's really weird that when people like graduate high school, which, you know, a lot of people do, um, graduate high school, they decorate their caps with Nason's like logo or someone's logo or a church related thing. Um, and they attribute their, their success their you, You're taught to attribute your success, your brain, your brains, um, your brain's wits to, to the apostle. You're, you're, you're going to attribute it to God. You're going to dedicate your, your degree to this man. Um, maybe you're, maybe you're just, um, um, 
maybe you're just studying PR, but, but nevertheless, you know, maybe in the future, at some point you can serve the man of God, you can serve the church, you can get a job like that. Um, uh, so I very thankfully like was born into, born into the period where getting a, getting a degree of higher education was, um, was much more acceptable and respectable. Uh, but at the same time, I also grew up around a lot of uh, young men who would reach the age of 18, who would leave high school, but they wouldn't go on to, uh, to go get another degree, to, to go get an actual degree. They would, they would be pushed into going into the ministry. And so, and so, and so as a, as a young person, you're, you're taught that, yeah, there are multiple avenues with which you can serve the church. You're going to go and get your degree of higher education and, and then, you know, serve your church in your own way like that, or, or, Hey, how about maybe, they don't say this exactly, but it's kind of the thinking behind it. Hey, maybe God hasn't prepared you for that. Maybe your talents are preaching out uh, his word on, out on the streets. And that's where your purpose is. Um, I grew up around a lot of young men who didn't end up going to college and ended up getting into the ministry and being sent out into the rest of the world. Or, or maybe they do go into the ministry a little bit. And then eventually they, they get permission from, uh, from the higher ups to, to leave the ministry and go study somewhere a lot and then, but study something, but like you have to study something that is going to serve the church, be, become a lawyer, become a, an accountant or something like that. Right. Uh, I, for me, when I reached the age of 18, I, uh, I very thankfully, like um, I, I love, I really love school and like just, just through just, I'm just really lucky to where I was really, uh, I was very okay. Very like the okay, like B student at school in high school. And then in the last year, I really got my act together and I ended up going to like a university and spending a lot of time there. And, and while I was going to the university and sometimes skipping church and stuff, and, but I still had this, you know, people still had an understanding of me as like, oh, well, AJ's like a good kid. Maybe he can't be in the ministry. He, maybe he's a little too shy for it, but, but at least he's, he's, uh, he's, you know, he's a, he's a responsible young man and he's getting his degree and he's going to eventually you know turn that into the church and for the services of us and the betterment of our community is it um, kind of like the ministry mm, is better than going to college is that kind of the vibe uh i think I, I think for sure that that is what a lot of people would say if you were to word it and if you were to word if you were to make them pick between both things but but okay. still the uh but but it's still the understanding either way is that like oh well whatever direction you take you know as long as it ends up going back to the apostle going back to the church. Right. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I ended up going to the university of Houston for five years. I got two degrees and then I ended up going to, uh, to graduate school right now to get my PhD in history and, uh, very like, you know, very thankfully for me, you know, I, I didn't end up in the ministry like a lot of my friends right now who are, who are in it and are like literally stuck in different corners of the world because, right. because they're just stuck there preaching something. And there's this big controversy that's happening. And if they're out preaching in the middle of, you know, West Virginia, um, uh, those people that they're preaching to are bound to Google this church. And then they're going to find out, uh, oh, this dude's like arrested on whatever. Why is there all this weird like news on this church? This doesn't seem like a real like actual church. Uh, so it makes it harder on like those people, those, those friends that I grew up in. I very thankfully was good at school and could stay in it. And it was literally my escape from, from the organization. Uh, at some point, I... Uh, studied so much that I managed to get into graduate school in a city that was far from the nearest uh, church location. And for my first year, I still went to church. Like I, there was just still that, that big hovering, like um, influence from my parents and from my family uh, of like, okay, AJ, if you're going to go once a week uh, to church you, uh, and you're going to drive this far to go get to there, you better, you better pray a bunch. You better like really focus yourself. You better you better recognize that this is only temporary. You're only doing this to get a degree because then once you get it, you better move back to a big city with a church. And then there you're going to, you're going to really start to pay God back for, uh, for that time when you strayed yourself away to oh some extent. Um, it, it's really, it's really gross. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I have so much sympathy for you because I, like there are so many similarities, but luckily um, I think in a lot of cases, Mormonism for me was less extreme, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but man, the, the parallels are crazy. And you, you mentioned a while back, this whole idea of like, people just do this. Sometimes they claim to have seen God, they claim to have, you know, these amazing experiences, and then they start a religion. And truthfully, you're right. And sometimes it sticks. And sometimes it doesn't. 
And, you know, I think the reason why we see so many parallels is because the churches that stick have nailed down that method of human persuasion and, mm-hmm. and human control, which is that whole, like they do those, those subtle things to keep you um, not trusting yourself not um not able to question the organization like doubt yourself before you doubt the organization all of those things are parallel in all of these cults that are successful and i think they're successful because they just happen to employ the correct techniques they get gets a human brain you know stuck so this is just absolutely incredible so tell me a little bit more about the view of Nasson, because what I'm noticing in a lot of what you're saying is it seems to be that he is kind of the center of the religion, whereas I think, um, you know, other religions, they try to at least frame it that they're centered around Jesus or God or Jehovah or whatever. But it, it kind of sounds like there's a lot of like praying for Nasson and things like that. And Mormons, they do pray for like their their leaders, but it's it doesn't seem like with the, the same fervor. So I'm curious, like, mm-hmm. how do people view him? Is he is it is he the center of the religion or is it like he he is the center, but, you know, God is the center. I'm curious what that looks uh, like. He is, he is the absolute center of the organization. And only because like, I really like the term middleman because uh, at the end, of, you know, when it comes for, when it comes to La Luz and Mundo at the end of the day, everyone's, everyone's just human. And, uh, and God by his own rules, you know, or at least in the way he's behaved in the Bible, this is what they say. Uh, he's always picked one person to be the medium through him and the rest of humanity. And I'm not too sure what the thinking is there. Is it like humanity can't handle hearing the voice of God or just like, or does God pick one person and then have that person do his, do his job. And then that, and then he, but he, he sets it up that way as being like a sort of hurdle for people and seeing like, who's going to believe me, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, people, or, or here's another thing that in, in the old, they will point out that in the old Testament, God was very overt. He was just hanging out very like just showing himself off to a lot of people doing this, speaking to this person, speaking to this person, and um and then they uh la luz del mundo takes note of how later in the in the new testament the the sort of position and overtness that god has to the rest of humanity takes a step back and it starts to happen through like mediums of like you know like a jesus or and then an apostle paul and then the apostles like uh uh an advocate for jesus who is then like an advocate for god and you know there's that sort of like um um sort of uh funneling of 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 authority that happens and uh, that's how it gets up to the present day with Nason. It's uh, the idea is that Nason, uh, there are ideas of Nason being able to do miracles. And, and of course, he just absolutely hasn't. Uh, people claim that uh, people, people always give testimonies about how, how they saw Nason in like a dream or about how they, they, they prayed really hard at a certain moment that was really difficult in their lives. And then things turned out for the better. And then they, they attribute that to to them like really focusing on Nason and really thinking about how beautiful and magical he is. Um, There's, uh, and I, as a kid, not to say that, that the church exactly gave a sermon or said anything that, that, or not not to say that the church exactly said this and I heard it growing up. uh, But I know at some point when I was younger, I just had the idea. Yeah. Samuel can read my mind. Uh, when I go visit my my great aunt, uh, who happens to live in Samuel's house, that's a whole thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure she was a concubine of his. Um, when when my family, yeah, when my family goes to visit my my great aunt in the house of in the house of Samuel, uh, you know, she has a room on like a certain side of the house. Uh, and if I happen to run into Samuel in the hallway or something like that, you know, uh, I remember, I specifically remember thinking like, that dude is going to read my mind. That dude is going to uh, say hi to me, say hi to my parents. He's going to read my mind and probably going to snitch on me and tell, tell them like what I do bad or something like that. Um, that happens, you know, people, people have these ideas, people like grow up with this. Um, uh, there's, I don't know how exactly to explain this. And I'm not too sure if this is, I'm pretty sure this is not not an exaggeration, but I know at, at, within the past couple of years, at some point, Nason claimed that he like, diverted a hurricane that was headed for like costa rica or something um uh this is uh yeah i i i i can't i can't be very confident in saying this but i know that 
but but even the fact that's that the kind that of I stuff that's like perpetuated this. right that's the kind even of the fact that this is like out in the air is like well just people believe these things um really? yeah oh, and then and then now of course people have the idea that you know Nason is arrested and he's in jail and he's um he's just in big trouble but oh well you know even while he's over there he's still preaching to people and he's and God's uh, having angels uh, like sing to him while Nason is hanging out and uh, maybe even the other prisoners have heard the angels or maybe the prisoners are so fascinated by the fellow prisoners are so fascinated by how by how Nason is so holy and monk and monk like um, uh, people have uh, obviously like, you know, he's a leader of the organization and people shouldn't really be thinking about his sexual life. Like, you know, that's that's not a, a thing of uh, that's not like a topic of discussion or anything. But um, but but yeah, he, he has a wife. Um, and yeah, there's that apostle in the Bible who said that it is better to not get married and to stay like, um, pure for yourself and focus on God. But, uh, but yeah, for the apostle, he has a wife and he just, um, uh, he's married and he's human like all of us. And, um, that no matter what the center of gravity within it all is like, don't question this man. Why are you focusing on him in that way? Just focus on the fact that he has, he is ordained by God to do this thing um don't don't think about him um don't, don't think about his personal life and if you do and, and if you do see him like uh and he looks tired behind the podium or something like that where he's just working too hard or and also you know he's just he's he's still human like the rest of us right. they move the goalpost it is the sort of point but right. but regardless they they move the goalpost they move the goalpost with the purpose of uh entrenching into people's heads that this man is uh, is the the, whole, the most holy man on earth. He's innocent. He's honorable. He's uh, he's es el más hermoso. He's the most beautiful. He's the most beautiful man on earth. This is God's favorite person on earth. just like that's what the idea that they sell these people. Um, right. And as for miracles, yeah, uh, I don't, I can't say exactly miracles that I have heard people claim he has done. But, but yeah, there are those claims. There are those, right. definitely those things out in the air. Just kind of floating around, right? Just mm -hmm. like that, just keep people like, oh yeah, obviously this is the truth because Nason has diverted hurricanes, not all of them, sadly, but you know, his yeah. God and, power and course, is probably limited. <laughs> yeah. And then of course he's in jail now. And, um, and so the thinking is like, okay, well, if Nason's in jail and he's, he's absolutely not in trouble, he's absolutely, he's actually shouldn't be in trouble. Uh, why can't the man just like, why, why can't, why can't the, the roofs of the, of, of, of the LA County, like, um, courts just open up and then the stars align and then say like, look, this is not, this is Nason. He's my dude. Get him out. Like just, uh, the, 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 the. But by the logic of La Luz del Mundo, like very easily, God could just get them out of this trouble and make everyone look like fools of themselves. Um, uh, everyone who has left, uh, he could very easily do that. Like if, if there is the power of miracles like that, just it, it could very easily just dunk on all of us. But it hasn't happened. And so the thinking is and, and so the thinking that they that that church members then have is like, oh, well, this is um, God is allowing this to happen so that he can so that he can shake the rug and get the and get the dust out, which, you know, the people that aren't going to stick with this project, which is like, you know, someone like me that, you know, he's putting us through this big ordeal uh, before we end up getting to this point where we start expanding like crazy. Uh, he's uh, this is an ordeal that God has placed and Nason knows it. But uh, Nason's just going, you know, going with it. He's like, yeah, this is this is God's plan. I'm supposed to be in here in trouble. And uh, all you members are supposed to, this is a challenge to you all to see if you stay. And uh, oh yeah, it's just, uh, that, it's, it's, that's, just it's that's really insane. stupid. It's just, and it's, uh -huh. it's brilliant though, if you think about it, because, okay, so what, why is he in there? Because he's shaking the rug. He's getting rid of anyone who isn't very loyal to him, which means anytime AJ or someone else leaves the church, they just say, oh, that that's why he was shaking the rug. AJ's not really loyal, you know, and you know, or whoever. And I'm just like, oh my God, that's that yeah. is actually brilliant, right? Because it keeps those people that are really devoted from questioning. Cause they're like, oh no, this is exactly what they said would happen. Like this yeah. is exactly what they said would happen.
Okay, so tell me, I'm very curious about the whole process of baptism and conversion and what that looks like for like a regular member as opposed to someone who maybe converts uh, being saved. And also, I think we forgot to hit on that whole thing of like, if the apostle were to die before you got saved, you might go to hell. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, go, going back to sort of language that, that we were talking about, one of the sort of, well, one of the words within their vocabulary is simiente santa, which I'm pretty sure translates to uh, holy offspring or, or uh, uh, yeah, holy offspring. And so basically what holy offspring are people like me who, whose parents are both in church and, they, and then I am just born into the church as opposed to say my neighbor who is obviously not born into church uh, and if he were to convert into it, uh, he wouldn't be considered simiente santa, but uh, but still, nevertheless, he's a convert. Uh, so, I, and I think it's important to to point that out because people that are born into the church uh, go through certain things in, in very formative young years that people who convert when they're 35 or something like that just don't go through. Uh, to the same that they, they go through it in a different way. Uh, but yeah, for normal for for members like me who are born into the church. Um, uh, they, uh, there is, uh, the sort of rituals, sort of the landmarks within your life is, uh, you're born within 40 days of you being born. Uh, you should, your parents are going to present you, uh, in front of the church. Uh, I like the, at, at like the end of the sermon, both of your parents are together. One's holding the little infant. Y'all walked in the aisle. The pastor is going to say a few words. It doesn't really last too long. It's like five, 10 minutes. The pastor is going to say a few words. And then everyone, and then they say, here's a new, here's a new baby in our community. Uh, let's all, let's all get down and pray for the little baby. And then the pastor comes down and he like holds the little baby and probably gives it a kiss. Like th there's a, there's that little ritual to it. Um, that's when, that's when you're an infant. And before you turn 40 days, 40 days old. Also, if you're born into the church, they, it's also tradition to give you a name that comes from the Bible. And, uh, uh, that's cool because some people get like just very normal vanilla names like Daniel, David, except Pablo, whatever. But but other people get like really fucking weird names like myself. I get Abdiel, which is Hebrew, and it's in the Old Testament once. And it's in this weird part of the Old Testament in Chronicles where where the writer is just listing names and listing lineages, just a bunch of names, just Morgan, son of this, who had who begot these three people, who married this person, yeah. who yeah, like that crap, right? Uh, oh so yeah, God. some people... So, uh, so I got Abdiel. Abdiel is not too weird, but it is definitely weird. Uh, other people get really weird names that are in the Bible, really old Hebrew names. So there's that sort of stamping on your identity in that way. Right. Um, if you're born into it. Um, if you're a kid growing up, you go to kids studies. And uh, when you start to turn around 12, 13, you start to allow to go to adult studies, which you, you just go up, you know, and you sit with the adults. Um, and uh, the age of 14 is really important with, for people that are born into the organization because that is when a lot of indoctrination happens. That is when uh, a lot of things just come into play. Uh, and I pin it down to three things. There's a, there's a presentation of when you're 14, there's the baptism, and there's the revival. The presentation that happens is basically kind of like the, the one when you first turn, uh, before you turn 40 days years old, for 40, 40 days old. Um, the, the presentation is basically... Uh, the kid who is turning 14 uh, at some point um, at like the tail end of a sermon at some sort of uh, Sunday school for like 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It kind of depends. It's just, it's really small. Um, uh, you're, you're, you, you who are 14 are, are in the back of the church and you're going to walk down the aisle and your parents, both of your parents are both behind you. And basically what happens is they're going to present you and you've come at a certain age of maturity where you can start to make decisions for yourself, big, grand spiritual decisions for yourself. Right. And you have to announce them in front of the church. And these kids are, are all are often dressed. The women are often dressed in very like nice elaborate dresses, holding flowers, maybe like a headpiece or something. No, for sure, a fancy chalina, the women. And then the dudes uh, aren't going to have some big fancy like pageantry, but, you know, they are going to be in like a suit. They are gonna, they're going to be in a suit. They're going to look nice. Both of the parents are there. And basically what happens is the pastor, there's a microphone and the father, the father of the family is supposed to go up and give some sort of words of encouragement, uh, words of thanks to the church for helping them raise their kids to this point. Um, and uh, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for correcting my kid when he was wrong. Thank you for correcting me when I was wrong. Uh, thank you to, thank you to the apostle for his example. Thank you to the pastors who, who are the rep, the local representatives of the apostle that the apostle has sent. 
Um, uh, yeah, th those speeches try and they, they try not to last too long. They're little like a few minutes for each person, but still, like nevertheless, um, these people, you know, the sort of family is sort of up there at the center of attention, and with this, and but especially the fourteen-year-old kid is there at the center of the attention, and the rest of the church is looking, and the rest of the church is looking. And, you know, some many of them are like bored and they don't really want to be there. But nevertheless, there is this sort of moment where the kid is brought forth like that. And that's just that's just weird. Like, don't church isn't coercive in that way. I was not asked if I if I wanted to be presented when I was 14. It was just a given. It was just happening. Um, and then when some kids uh, I've seen kids who go up and they um, and they give their after the father gives uh, his own little sp spiel. The pastor maybe says like a word or two and then and then it's the kid who comes up to the microphone and is supposed to look everyone in the eye and say like uh hey i'm happy i'm 14 years old uh and you have to you have to answer they don't ask you the questions and then you reply it's more like you're up there and you're gonna have to answer these questions uh in your own way uh do are you gonna plan to continue going to church and are you gonna get baptized like you know what's gonna happen are you gonna do the other things that are really important for you as a 14 year old um oh and goodness. it's basically that the it's like on. <laughs> the, the pressure's on and and like what kind of nice young kid has speaking skills of that level for like a giant audience like that um if there's one thing that i liked about church is that it at least sort of gave me it sort of desensitized me or made me acclimated to speaking to large groups of people but but no like still when it happened it was a very like traumatizing and scary thing to do it was a very like weird ordeal um, and so you do that. You're supposed to go up there and say, yes, I'm going to get baptized. I want to continue going to church. Thank you to the apostle for his prayers. Thank you to you all for taking care of me. What kid that, that can thing. say no to that, right? What, what kid it's is going to no disappoint no his, no. his only community? <laughs> you know, uh, what kid is going to, you know, say the wrong answers to that question? No kid is uh -huh. going to do so that. So I have seen at least one instance where there's a young man and he goes up and he's, he's just too shy to speak. And I don't know if he was just too shy to speak or he wasn't really buying the whole thing, but, 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 you know, he goes up there and he just kind of doesn't give a word. And they're like, do you want to say something? And he's just kind of there with like a silent microphone and people just looking around waiting. And then I think the pastor or whoever said, well, well, we will, sp I'll speak to him later. You know, we can end this right now. And so they end it. That's and so, and so, yeah, when it ends is you get down, you, your parents leave you, uh, they walk away down the aisle, away from the, they walk down the aisle away from you. You're still there at the, at the center of the church. And you get down on your knees and you pray with everyone else, everyone, and everyone prays for you, for your, for your, for the, for your future. Right. Um, right. So that's the presentation. Uh, some people have big parties afterwards, uh, right. like, like, uh, like Ginsei kind of things for, for the women kind of. Yeah. Um, but again, it's like, no, it's like no alcohol and it's just a bunch of church people that end up going to the thing. And maybe you have a little bit like a play date with other kids around your age, but um but you're not going to be alone. It, it, it's, it, th there's a whole like pageant sheet to it. Um, so that's, so that's three things that happen. So back to the three things that happen when you're born into the church and when you're 14. So that's the bat, that's the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, the baptism is easy uh, in that just at some point within the next six months, like maybe every four months they do it, but every like six, six months, like once, twice a year, they, they end up having the church organizes a baptism and they gather all the people that need to be baptized and they do a baptism uh, at like a Sunday school and it's uh you you and all the other people go down the aisle you're in front of the pastor you're in front of everyone else you have to answer seven questions it's like uh the questions range from like do you believe that the apostle that you have to believe in him to get salvation do you do you renounce the the world and all of its temptations do you promise to do you understand that that this baptism is this and this and you need it in order to get salvation? you know those sorts of questions right, right. it's like seven of them and then you answer them and then and then you take turns getting baptized fully submersed in water fully submersed in water and they're very strict about that because yeah. if you like submerse yourself and like say you lift your toe out or something like that in the middle of it and you're not fully submerged at some point um then it doesn't count and mormons uh, are the same way that's so random uh, yep and uh and the thinking is that like okay you're 14 um we, we're not going to baptize you very as an infant, like, like the Catholics do, because the Catholics believe in original sin and we don't believe in that. But now at the age of 14, you are responsible for your own salvation, given that you're going to be your own adult now. 
and you, you have to get baptized and now you are on a clean slate. Okay. Go start your life. Um, right. and so, and so here's another thing. It's, uh, the parents or parents within the cult are taught that, uh, should your child die prior to reaching the age of 14 and getting baptized, uh, should your child die, you, you too, as the parents are responsible for that, for that kid's salvation. And so, and so again, this sort of harkens back to, to why you shouldn't get married outside of church, which is if you're married to someone outside of church and they're all sinning and they're not believers and they say something bad, you're posing, you're putting the, you're putting your child's salvation at risk. Right. Um, right. Uh, so that's the, so that, so the 14th birthday, the baptism is pretty easy. Like, cause it just, it just happens and it's done. Uh, what's, what's the third, the third component to, um, to, to becoming part of the church or becoming fully integrated as a member are the spiritual revivals. So, right. uh, so if you're, if you're, if you come into the church as an adult, say 20, you know, past the age of 14, uh, all you really have to do are the baptism and the revival. You don't have to do the 14th birthday, uh, but that's not too, I guess that's, that's kind of okay, but, but still everyone has to go through the revivals and there's a different within the, within the church, there's a differentiation between there, Dif there's a differentiation made very starkly between between the members and it is those who have received and those who have not received uh everyone can get baptized you know that's really easy uh and everyone can get washed of their sins like that you know it's uh it's not that hard you just go up and say yes and you get baptized and you're done um but even then you know it is some sort of there is there are course of elements to it but the revivals are where uh, a lot of self-indoctrination happens a lot of programming happens and where a lot of self-deception like comes into play for people. And it, it's, uh, it's one of people's most intense, like ex spiritual experiences that they ever experience that they ever have. But, um, but in the, in the way that it has happened and in what you're told to think and how you're repeating things to yourself, uh, that is where it gets like pretty traumatizing. Right. So, so, so what is it that, what is the goal in the revivals? The, and the revivals are kind of like the baptisms and that they happen like once, twice a year. Uh, not, not too often, but, um, the, the, the goal of the revivals is for you to end up, uh, speaking in tongues at some point. And when you speak in tongues, um, a, a pastor, a minister is going to be nearby monitoring you. And when he hears it, he's going to think, yeah, this person's speaking in tongues. God is, God is channeling through him right now. And we can't understand what this person is saying. You know, this is God's language, but, he, but this person, this young kid right here is speaking it. this adult here is speaking it they have received the Holy spirit. God has entered them. Um, they are no longer spiritual orphans. Um, cause you can get baptized and you're free of your sin, but you're still not considered one of God's children. You're still considered a spiritual orphan and you need to go through this thing. Um, in order to, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so I, I've heard of some, in, so let me like explain what the revivals are. I've heard in some instances, the, the duration of it is two weeks, but most often it's like one week, three, four days, five days. It kind of depends on who the pastor is sure. and how, I'm not too sure how they determine this stuff, but I know that I've seen, I've heard of ones that last two weeks in Guadalajara. And, and then I've heard of, I, and I've heard of others and I've been through others that are like one week, five days, three days. And so what it is, is that uh, for those days, however many amount of days in the afternoon, um, there it's revivals, you know, it's not going to be normal church, you know, all the church members can go and whatever, but it's going to be revivals and those, um, uh, those members that are seeking to gain the Holy spirit are going to be seated up front and the benches are moved and you're going to lay on and you're going to sit on the carpet or something like that. Like the sort of within the interior of the church, it's kind of changed a little bit. And, uh, the women are separate from the men and you, you're going to hear, they're going to have typically a sort of visiting pastor who is from out of town, speaking some words trying to convince people, trying to really sell them on the message of, of they need to, they need to focus on themselves. You need to get rid of all those bad temptations in your head. You need to, you need to promise God right here that you're going to dedicate your life to him. You know, you have, the goal is to, you have to convince God to let you speak tongues today. Um, and you really need this to get your salvation. Uh, you really need your baptism and you really need your revival. If you get your baptism, um, and you don't get your revival. Yeah. You're going to hell. I, I, I literally went through this for like a year. I failed, uh, three, four times, something like that. Um, and, and across the span of like a year and a half or something like that. And it, it was just really like, just really gross. Did you um, finally speak in tongues at one point and get saved? Uh, I, we'll get to that, but basically oh, God, okay. short, when, when I was, I, I went, 
my, that my last ordeal of revivals was like a week. I go through it and I, it was definitely the one that I focused the most on that I took the most serious. Right. But at the end of the week, if you had asked me like, Hey, do you think you spoke in tongues? I would have said, no, I don't think so. But, but I was, but then eventually once they announced the names of who it was, uh, I did speak it and I was the first announced and I was like, Oh, what the fuck? Cool. It wasn't cool because like, Oh, cool. God channeled through me. It was really just cool. This is over with. I don't have to fucking no, do I this don't anymore. have to do this again. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so here's the sort of ritual of it is, you know, they have a pastor that comes in, all the people are, are the revival people are there uh, and they give like a little sermon that's like 30 minutes, but then for the rest of the night from like, I don't know, seven or something, like some people stay on their knees for like an hour and pray a lot. Some people stay on their knees for two hours, but uh, there was one instance where I literally stayed on my knees crying for like four or five hours, uh, just really trying to convince God. And I, and I opened my, at some point I opened my eyes and I, I realized that everyone was gone in the temple. Like the, there was at some moment in, in my attempt to get the, to get the Holy spirit where I literally like really tuned out all the surroundings like within this basement that I was in where there were hundreds of people and uh that that's a really weird moment for me to reflect on where I was like I I was literally praying so hard that I tuned out the fact that that just everyone was gone by the time I opened my eyes it was 11 p.m and it was like my two parents there and like one dude who was just watching over me and I I went home like in silence and I was like I don't even know if I received so yeah so what it is is that for several hours over the span of different over, over the span of several days uh, you just go through these sessions of praying really hard and trying to get the Holy Spirit. Uh, but this isn't just normal praying where, you know, you're going to pray, you're going to say some words, you close your eyes, you're on your knees, uh, which is how the, the La Luz del Mundo members do it. Uh, it's you're praying, you're doing that. But, uh, but this time you're going to really, you're going to stay on your knees and you're going to keep praying. And at some point, once you, once you're done your little initial normal prayer and you're sort of settled into it, uh, it evolves into much more. Right. where you are taught to say Gloria a Cristo, glory to Christ, over and over again with your mouth, over and over again, Gloria a Cristo, glory, literally like thousands of times uh, in, in every like little session, every little night, you know, and, but, but separate your mouth from your brain and your brain, praise God and become elaborate there with your words, you know, say, say God, you know, um, God, please bless me. God, I was born into this. God, uh, you gave the spirit to my family to, to, uh, to my neighbor, to my sister, I'm here on my knees with my friends, and I want you to have mercy on me. Don't let me be a spiritual orphan. These are things that the, these are things that you're taught to say. And while you're doing this, sometimes, and if people if people see you on your knees and you're sort of like a little quiet and you seem maybe not so encouraged to keep going, you seem tired. Uh, normal brothers will walk, you know, can be in, can be allowed to walk up to you and speak some words of wisdom into your ear uh, to to sort of right. encourage you to you know get stay on your knees like even if you're bleeding uh to keep going at it it's really it's really traumatizing and it gets really it gets really weird because i i felt that at some point where i i recognized that my brain that that my mouth that my brain was so separate and like focused on praising god and you know being elaborate with my words and speaking you know just through my thoughts um that my that it became separate from the physical thing happening with my mouth where i was saying gloria cristo over and over again and it eventually evolves into babbling and it evolves into babbling and then it evolves into, you know, it can, Gloria Cristo can be uh, diluted into certain syllables, you know, certain babbles, right. but then it gets weird because the babbles start to transform into other things uh, that don't, that are, don't really lead you up back to Gloria Cristo. And, right. and people recognize this within themselves as, as it's happening. And then they're, of course, they're surrounded by church members who are watching them. They're surrounded by other people who are crying and babbling. Um, you're really sweaty. You're on your knees. Your knee starts to hurt. Um, right. Uh, you're told you're told to not wipe your boogers as, as they start to come out your nose and you know, to not wipe your tears. Uh, right. Just stay certain. in that state. Stay in that kind of trance state. It, it's it's really a trance. It really is. Um, and then, of course, if you're they, they tell you, they're like, yeah, you're going to start sweating. You're going to start battling. You're, you're going to have a bunch of snot dripping down your face. Um uh, but don't, don't be embarrassed about that. If you're embarrassed about that, that's the devil speaking to you. Just oh let go gosh. of it. And don't worry. You're in this community here that's gone through it or that is going through it now. And if, and if they start to like have a sort of criticism of you of like, oh, that dude's gross with his snot and whatever, uh, mm -hmm. God's going to punish them really, really hard. So, you know, God's on your side. He's sort of advocating for you to come and try to, uh, 
um, sell yourself to him and not be an orphan anymore. And so you go through this uh, several sessions and uh, there's ministers walking around and, you know, they're sort of paying attention to like, who's really into it, who's sort of lifting their hands and who's really just right. um, into the whole ordeal. And then they're going to go eventually listen to you. And they're like, uh, yeah, he's speaking in tongues, yeah, write him off, sure. write him on the list. Done, done. That's crazy. It, it's, it's traumatizing. Uh, one, one last, uh, yeah. one, one last, one last point is uh, uh, I know at some, I know sometimes I have seen, I have seen the, the revivals be where it's like Monday through Friday, we're going to have the revival sessions every night. And then on Sunday, after, after the Sunday service, we're going to, everyone stand up. Um, I'm going to have the list right here of all the people who got it. And so there's this moment, gigantic moment of tension where it's like the, and, and it's Sunday. So it's like, everyone's there and it's just like, okay. Uh, we, everyone has a sort of general idea of who was in the revivals, who wasn't, but, but right now I'm going to name all the people and they name the people. And some, sometimes they give the number saying like 49 people got it this week. The, uh, this many people, this many boys, as many girls. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I remember like certain moments in my upbringing where I, I just dreaded those days where I was like, and then of course I failed it like three, four times over the first like year and a half, something like that. And um, uh, it's just really traumatizing because it's like, uh, they, they really, that, that's where a certain moment of differentiation starts to happen to young people or just people in general that are going through the revivals. It's right. like, it's What's like, oh, wow, those, yeah. wow, those 20 dudes got it and they got called up and, you know, they go to the back of the church, they get into a low line, they walk up the aisle again, they're handed a little palm, sort of a leaf. And that, that's supposed to, you know, just as a little simple thing. And you actually like get a little sash. What the fuck? You get a little sash too that says, right. I don't know what it says, Hijo de un rey, something like that. They sing that song to you. That you're the son of a king, the son of God now. Right. And uh, you walk down the aisle. They give you this little thing. They give you a little sash. They give you a palm. And then uh, you face the church. And then the church is like, look, these are your new spiritual brothers, blah, blah, blah. Let's all pray for them. And then everyone prays. And then, of course, you know, within the crowd, there's still people who weren't called. And they have to pray, too. And then, uh, you know, people kind of know that you were th that you were trying that week also. And then they they, they noticed that like, yeah, you're up there. Don't you're up here. Up. You're not down there. Um, you fucked up. Uh, try harder next time. By the way, if you by the way, if you if you die before the next time, uh, God may not have mercy on your soul and you may die and you're going to go to hell. And because you just you, you didn't take this seriously. Um, so I've seen that to where it's, you know, sometimes they 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 have the sessions and then they wait until Sunday to announce it. But, uh, in my later years, uh, I start to see, I started to see in, in Houston where they would have the little sessions and actually it's within the session. Whenever they noticed someone was, was receiving, they would immediately go and start to put the sash on them and give them the little thing. And they saying like, you're receiving right now, or, or, Hey, you just received five minutes ago. And, um, right. And then they, so basically they do it in front of everyone, like no matter what, you know, the sort of that anointment, right. the sort of recognition of you've reached this level of spiritual maturity uh it's done in front of everyone and and um and the stakes are raised because it's like well are you have you are you someone that has received um if you haven't then look at that example uh and then once you receive it's like guard it fucking guard it like you're you just god just like god just passed through you and uh you're not a spiritual orphan and you can and you can save yourself you're not actually saved by the way but like you can oh. save yourself you can super duper save yourself now <laughs> <laughs> get closer yeah, oh my god uh -huh. oh my um, gosh that's insane uh so so then uh uh so then again like um uh pe people that aren't born in the church don't have to go to the 14th birthday but they still for sure have to go through the baptisms and the revivals this these things happen like once twice a year and uh uh and and sometimes in these revivals you will see like very elderly people who are like in their 60s or 70s can't even get on their knees because they're like in a wheelchair or they're just you know they, they're just um slightly disabled in that way if not disabled and um you know maybe they're like late converts and uh it's really gross but like i've heard people like like use them as examples to up uh, to their young kids saying like you oh. don't want to be that guy who's been like an orphan for decades you know there are people who have been like that you don't want to be that guy who's been an orphan for decades um uh, or you don't want to be that guy um because you, you or you don't want to end up being like this person who's 30 and they've literally they were born into the church and they've been trying for decades and guess what uh and that dude over there he's not even trying like he's not even over there like he knows he's the revive he knows the, he knows the revivals are happening 
he's never received. And look, he's not, he didn't even sign up to become part of it. it, it oh. It's really, it's really gross. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, AJ, this is absolutely amazing. And this video is getting a little bit long. So I think what we're going to do here is we're going to end this video here. And if you want to hear more about Nasson's trial and about why he was arrested, all the reasons he was arrested and what's the, the conspiracies that are coming out of it, as well as what the lawyers are doing to handle the situation, click, um, we'll have that video, maybe not quite yet, but it'll be in the description when the video is ready. And we're also going to do a video interviewing AJ about his personal, you know, uh, what we say, like ex-conversion, like leaving the yeah, religion. deprogramming. Yes, you're deprogramming. Um, also, don't forget to check out those resources in the description. Check out AJ's channel, The Money Store. AJ, thank you so much for coming yeah, today. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, I'm like blown away. I like I feel like people watching this, like just like watching my face, they they'll probably see me go play so many times. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for watching, and a huge thanks to our Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. If you want to consider becoming a supporter of this channel, you can click the link below to sign up on Patreon. Okay, thank you guys, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Bye everyone.